the uh, electoral webinars are well known for starting five minutes before the, the start of the show. And uh, typically what we like to do is do an unboxing. Uh, and unfortunately, I haven't received any packages this week. Uh, sorry, today. But I did receive a package this week, which I unpacked. And therefore, I've got a chance to show it to you. I don't know if you've seen one of these. Oh, it's heavy. But it's uh, a PCB printer. Ooh. Have, have you used one of those before? I have not. I rely no. on the big <laughs> Okay, my recommendation is don't unpack it and install it at 10 o'clock at night because you'll still be sitting there at 1 o'clock in the morning <laughs> making your first board. <laughs> so it's absolutely brilliant little thing here. Um, it's got a little head print head in it which squirts conductive ink onto a piece of FR4 board. And here you can see a little board I made last night. This is part of the example um, board that uh, comes with the with the software. So it's a little 555 timer based board for blinking a light. Um, yeah, and uh, I've just been trying it out to find out how it works. It's, it's very straightforward. It, in fact, it's a shame just to show the hardware because the software is actually uh, equally, equally brilliant. So as you work your way through a design, I'm just trying to balance it over there. As so you wait, Stuart, as, as that ink dries, can you then solder to it is the idea? Yeah, exactly. So the, um, the, the, the process is that you sort of upload your design and then it prints it, which and that will take about 15 minutes after you've calibrated it. Um, and then there's a curing process, which takes about an hour. So there's a heater in the bed and it goes up to about 200 degrees Celsius or so, and it cures, cures the ink then for about uh, um, an hour. And after that, uh, you can't solder on it like standard copper. You, you can't use such high temperatures. So you need to use a lower temperature up to sort of 180 to 210 Celsius. Um, but after that, um, if, you, if you take care of that, then you're okay to, to solder it. And there's actually a second step. Once you've printed the board, you can actually then put the solder paste on, apply all your uh, components, and then you use the heater again to, um, to solder them all onto the board. So, And the other thing... That you've got is a, a little drill attachment that you can add to that too. So if you want to do through hole boards, double sided boards, you can drill the holes. There's little copper uh, rivets to make um, to make vias and stuff. Yeah. So all in all, very clever thing. That's getting put on the Christmas list. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's hope Santa has enough money to buy one. But uh, yeah, if you'd make a lot of boards, if and if you need to do lots of revisions, and uh, especially if you're doing like high twenty-four hour turnarounds, so it's, it's a really good, uh, really good way of uh, of um, yeah, keeping those costs down because uh, you can iterate straight away. So the other thing is as well, um, you can do a partial board if it doesn't print properly, or you want to add something like a correction to an existing board. You can print onto an existing board and, and just do part of the circuit. Uh, and things like that. So that's quite good for, you know, it's a bit like doing a, a what we call a fib on a piece of silicon. Uh, jump the tracks. <laughs> now, you, now you've got me thinking, and I'm going to be distracted the whole webinar now. So <laughs> I, I blame you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, well, my clock says it's five o'clock here in Germany. Uh, so I would like to officially open our Elector Meet the Engineers part two and welcome our guests uh, from NVIDIA and Spark Fun today. My name's Stuart Cording, and I'm your moderator for the show today from Elector. And our focus today is on AI and machine learning. Uh, so what we're going to do is going to start off by looking at some AI and machine learning basics to try and understand where did all this come from, um, what started it all, um, how do these things work, what's, what are all the, the neural networks behind it all. And the reason we've got our guests here today is because we've got some great new AI hardware to take a look at, along with a, a robot kit that uses that. Now, it's really important that you stay here till the end because uh, we're gonna have a Q&A session for the guys here. So get your ideas ready. The Q&A box is down on your right-hand side. It should be active. So if you've got a question you'd like us to ask at the end, make sure to put the questions in there because in the public chat, it's a bit more difficult to find any questions that pop up. So if you could do that for us, that would help. We're going to, we are recording already. We've already started. So as per usual, the recording will be available later on Elector TV. And uh, yeah, just join in, use the chat. Uh, there's loads of people on here that uh, know each other from previous uh, shows as well. So that's great to see everyone 
participating from all over the world. And um, yeah, have fun. So we're going to get straight to it. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our guest today. First is Azia Rans from NVIDIA. Azia loves surfing the, the new technology waves, and he likes uh, helping people um, from newcomers to experienced developers making technological breakthroughs. He's previously worked in virtual reality development, Oculus, blockchain, at, um, synthesis, and also on quantum computing at IBM Research. And now he's at NVIDIA, he's uh, working with universities, he's working with makers and development communities and helping them to adopt the NVIDIA Jetson for powerful and cost-effective edge AI technology. So a quick question to you, Azir. Um, where are you based and what time is it there? Yeah, I am based in Madrid. It's 5 p.m. here. Yeah. Okay, so we're all in the same time zone and we've had a, yeah. a, day, a day of work behind us already. Super. Uh -huh. And um, you've You've basically, as you've said, you're, you're surfing the technology waves. Um, yeah. <laughs> which, which which technology is is the one that uh, is the most amazing to you out of uh, virtual reality, blockchain, quantum computing, yeah. and AI? Well, uh, so quantum computing was amazing to work with because it's really strange, really, really strange. Uh, I think I'm more maybe in love for, uh, with VR because I think VR is going to be big really soon because hardware is getting cheaper and cheaper. And I think, in, I don't know, three to five, Yes, we will have something. In, maybe you can you could go to Nike or Adidas uh, stores and buy some kind of VR to to do some kind of exercise. Also, AI is going to help VR because of um, all these new technologies we have at Nvidia, like uh, DLSS and all this uh, ray tracing stuff. So, I think VR Thanks. is going to be my favorite soon. But uh, AI is really amazing, and each month we have something new which is crazier than the previous month. So probably you have seen this. Uh, gener generative adversarial networks, the guns are making amazing stuff. So yeah, nice. Super. I think both are there. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, then our other guest today is Derek Runberg. He's from Spark Fun, and he's the strategic partnerships and services manager there. And his focus is on collaborating with companies to bring new ideas to life. Previously, um, he was at Spark Fun in the Department of Education and authored a book called the Spark Fun Guide to Processing. Brilliant programming environment. If you've not tried it, I think it's uh, great fun to use. And he's also the co-author of the Inventor's Guide to Arduino. And previously, he worked as a middle school teacher uh, teaching technology and engineering. So, Derek, what's it like moving from the world of of education uh, and teaching uh, into into industry? It's a, that's a good question. It, it actually, I feel really comfortable in in both situations because it's all about learning and problem solving and finding a solution. It's just what that solution is, is very different and at different scales between the two. Um, if, if you ask me, probably the, the most terrifying thing is uh, teaching adults. Kids are easy. You give me your middle school kid, uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, I can handle a, a snot-nosed kid any day. Um, but when, <laughs> you, when you give me, uh, give me an adult, uh, they terrify me. And so, that, that's sometimes because uh, they ask hard questions. Um, I was going to say it's, it's the questions, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you'd be surprised at how quickly students, uh, kids can pick up these concepts where it might take us adults a little bit longer. Um, and I don't can't put my finger on it, but it's it's about the willingness to learn, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Super. Excellent. Well, we'll get to talk that, about that a little bit more later. Um, as I said, we've um, at Electra have been doing a lot of articles and projects and research on artificial intelligence um, and machine learning. They're very much related topics. Uh, I don't know how many of you have actually had the opportunity to get involved with those sort of things. So what I wanted to do was start off with a, an article. Um, it's actually an article I've written, which is available on, online, and it's a four-part series. Um, and it's called Understanding the Neurons in Neural Networks. And it's an opportunity to really go back to the basics. Uh, for me personally, I, I love all the technology that we have and all the, the tools we have available, but sometimes I find that they're really, really very high level. And I'd like to understand in more detail actually what happens under the hood and, and how things really function. And it probably comes a bit out of my background in history. I used to work for semiconductor manufacturers and uh, we were heavily involved, obviously, in designing all the peripherals and the processing cores of those devices. So it was really important to understand and know how everything was interlinked and functioned and, and why and how. Now, of course, today, AI and machine learning are now 
part of the lingua franca. Everybody on the street will probably have an idea of what AI is and machine learning. Most likely, uh, they're going to link it to autonomous driving or even sort of face recognition technology and things like that, quite simply because it's often in the press. Um, but the start of uh, the research into this sort of technology goes back many, many years. Although we're seeing a lot more of it today, it's taken a very long time for us to actually get here. And research started into artificial neurons uh, way back in the 1940s. And the idea then was to try and see if we could somehow replicate the function of the brain. So in 1943, uh, the first type of network that was developed was called the McCulloch Pitts network. And it's a very, very simple design. Um, it's, it takes several inputs, it sums those together, and then it has a, what's called an activation function. Now this activation function is a very, very simple threshold. Um, you can write it in C quite simply by, by saying, if this variable is greater than five, then we put uh, something on the output. And if it isn't greater than five, then we, we don't put something on the output. So it's, it's very, very simple to do. And these types of McCulloch Pitts networks were used initially to try and replicate a logic functions such as and and or and not. And that was a very, very basic first attempt to actually implement some artificial neurons. Now, the challenge with these was that it wasn't really possible to make them learn. So a lot more work went in to try and make them more um, advanced. Um, that led us to the in the 1950s to what's called the perceptron, which was uh, developed by Frank Rosenblatt. And that was actually something that could learn. And the way it learned was actually by having a, a repetitive cycle where the inputs were, com uh, were applied, the output was compared with what was desired. And that process, um, if it didn't work, if, if the output didn't uh, deliver what was expected, then they made some adjustments to the weights. Um, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, the weights here are the, the numbers, uh, the black numbers, plus one, plus one, minus two, for example, in, in the top right hand side there. And uh, that learning process was then applied until it actually functioned. And it led in 1958 to the IBM Mark I Perceptron. Now, this was a huge device. Uh, the learning was actually implemented using potentiometers connected to electric motors. And they actually use photo cells. And in front of the photo cells, they held up pictures of shapes. And they actually managed to teach this um, IBM machine to recognize simple shapes like squares and triangles and so on and so forth. And that was really the first sort of breakthrough in, in something that learned. But the problem with the perceptron is that it's only any good at solving what are called linearly, linearly separable problems. So what does that mean? Uh, things like AND and OR are linearly separable. And we see the AND and OR tables on this slide here uh, on the left-hand side. And what, what it means, linearly separable, is that I can draw a line between the desired and the undesired outputs. So for AND, we only have, uh, we have one is the desired output when both inputs are one. And for OR, we have three occasions when the desired output is one um, and one location where the desired output is zero. Uh, but when it comes to XOR, this is a situation where we can't linearly separate the desired outcomes. Uh, we have to group those. And to do that, we're going to need a circle to group those together. And this problem it took a while to resolve, but it was resolved eventually in form of what's called the multi-layer network. And that used as the threshold function something called the sigmoid squashing function. That's what we see on the right-hand side. Now, what you can imagine here is that as this network is learning, it starts by sitting somewhere in the middle of that graph that you can see on the slide there. And it's encouraged to quickly move its way up to one or quickly move its way back down to zero. And the nice thing about the sigmoid squashing function, it can also be um, differentiated, which is an important element of the calculations that actually lie behind it. Now, that leads to the multi-layer perceptron, or MLP, which is what we here, see here on the left-hand side. And this is probably the, the classic diagram that uh, you've been seeing when anyone's been talking about AI and machine learning. And if you look on the web for any of these types of topics, this is precisely the type of um, visual that will be uh, made available for the MLP. What happens is we apply the inputs on the left-hand side, the outputs come on the right-hand side, and in the middle, we have some hidden nodes. And those hidden nodes help us to um, solve problems which are not linearly separable. And that sigmoid squashing function is used in those hidden nodes and in the output nodes 
uh, to actually create the, the learning function. When we apply something to the input on the left hand side, we get an output on the right hand side and that's called feed forward, the feed forward calculation. And that's quite simply calculates the outputs. So for example, if I apply um, one and zero on the inputs to, and I expect this network to function as an XOR logic gate, um, then I would expect one of these output nodes to provide me a one to say, yes, what I've seen on the front end is um, one zero or zero one with a high probability. And that's what's going on there. If that's not the case, if the probability of it being what we're looking for is, is low, then what we need to do is we need to tune all those weights. And those weights are marked as W1 to W8 there on the links between the input nodes and the hidden nodes, and then the hidden nodes and the output nodes. So what we do is we calculate the error, and then we optimize those weights. And then we try the feed forward process again and see if we're closer to being able to detect the things we want. And basically, these types of MLPs they simply tell us what is the likelihood of what's being applied at the input being what we're looking for. Now, obviously, when these get very, very complicated, that comes into things like natural speech processing, where we can recognize the individual words a person speaks, where it might be image processing when we're looking to discover handwritten numbers or even recognize animals in complicated pictures or, or objects such as ships and, um, and cars. And it's basically all about um, probability. What is the likelihood of what I'm looking for being in this image, in this sound file, or in this collection of data I have? So this is all uh, described in, in the article, as I mentioned. So if you'd like to see the first part of the series, uh, we'll provide the link to that later. Um, included with the series is also some code examples. So we've put the whole uh, MLP calculations on there. We've included an Excel file. A lot of this is based upon uh, a software engineer uh, called Matt Mazur, who did a very, very deep go, uh, deep uh, dive on the on the back propagation mathematics. So that's very complicated, but there's a link there as well if you want to. Uh, we provide some article um, examples which are written in processing, so you can actually see how the MLP learns. And later on in the series, we'll also be applying it to an Arduino, and you can use an RGB sensor to actually recognize specific colors that you're searching for. So before we move on and talk to our guests in a bit more detail, we're just going to introduce you, uh, give you a chance to participate in a survey. And our survey is a question on AI. And what we'd like to know is, have any of you out there already built a machine learning application? As we said, we've, we've covered the topic many times uh, on, online in the Elector uh, articles and also in the magazines. Uh, interestingly enough, if you get the paper version of the magazine from us, uh, the last edition we had was actually created together with SparkFun. And uh, Derek actually contributed an article about the SparkFun Jetbot, which is uh, what we're going to be talking about later on. So perhaps you've already had a chance to have a look. So I think everybody has had a chance to participate. We've got some good answers. And I'm going to end voting and share those results. I hope everybody can see the results. I can only see what I'm, I think I'm showing you. So uh, to me, it looks like uh, the majority, about 45% um, here, I think have said that uh, they haven't had the opportunity to build a machine learning application yet, uh, whereas 20% have. So that's interesting, that's good. So uh, hopefully you'll get an opportunity today to find out a bit more and decide how your machine learning journey and artificial intelligence journey um, is going to go. Great stuff. So with that, I'd like to move on to Azia. Um, so what we wanted to do today is uh, look at two exciting new products. Um, they actually build on one another. And the, the product, the Jetson Nano Development Kit, comes from NVIDIA. And I wanted to start by asking you, Azia, um, why, have, why have you developed this kit, and what's the target audience for it, and the types of applications you think people are going to be using it for? Yeah, no, I'm mute. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we developed this because, yeah, so makers, enthusiasts, and educators, or researchers, uh, uh -huh. they, they needed an AI platform to test prototypes in an easy and affordable or and modular way while having the same software tools and stack across all the NVIDIA platforms and, and devices. So you can you can use CUDA directly in a very small and cheap device. 
and that wasn't possible before because you needed usually a big GPU and usually a big camera or something connected. Now with a very cheap uh, equipment, you can do almost the same. And you can always escalate to, uh, to a bigger one because the platform is completely compatible with all NVIDIA technologies. Exactly. So, I mean, I think most of our viewers will know NVIDIA primarily as a, as a graphics card supplier. Um, what is it about these these GPUs that uh, you've been integrated in graphic cards for years um, in, uh, useful for AI and machine learning applications? Yeah, so all these GPUs have been re really useful, but when you need to, to implement something industrially or in an industrial environment or even in in a city where, where you need to to control pedestrians or cars uh, so these these small devices fit really well and also the, the good part is that you can if you use the developer kit you can use this even in, in a university to learn from scratch how to program with ai and then even with the same device when you left the university you can go to an industry and and use this device for a professional project because it's completely modular so one of the focus areas that's often talked about in conjunction with these sort of devices is edge AI. What, what does edge AI mean? So edge AI is uh, usually uh, usually we, we we are used to use the cloud for everything. We like when you say I'm not going to say the name of Alexa because I say it's going to listen to me. But <laughs> uh, when you say Alexa. <laughs> She's going to to ask the, the cloud and, and find a, an answer. So if you have uh, something that is completely disconnected from the internet, you can also have an AI model on it. So HAI is doing that. You can have the, the whole model directly in the hardware without needing a, a connection. This could be useful for privacy things, but also uh, there are some environments where you don't have internet. Uh, we, we are used to have internet everywhere, but you can be in a mountain, in a farm, even in Mars, uh, where you don't have internet and you, you need to do something like uh, this small helicopter uh, NASA flew. So they did it with its AI and they trust it. And after eight minutes, I don't remember how many minutes, they, they saw, OK, it worked. So that is its okay. AI. It's some kind of um, AI that you can run in a small hardware, uh, well, small or big, but without any kind of connection. So. Um, we've got this this ability now with Edge AI to to run our our uh, machine learning applications without the use of the cloud. Uh, what about the the learning process? Because I understand that the learning process for these algorithms is is very intensive. Do I have to use the cloud for that, or does the the Jetson Nano allow me to do the learning on the chip? Uh, the, okay, the training, right? So, yeah. yeah. So so training, so uh, I just, in fact, I think I can, let's see if I can switch my, well, I have something here. Uh, I, it's, it's easy to see, so give me a second. I'm going to open a video. I, I, did, I did a training to, to, to make a pepperoni pizza. So this was for a maker fair in, on Italy. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can do the training directly on the Nano. So I did a training. <laughs> I don't know if you see, I think you can see it, yes. So I did a training to to detect the pepperonis. So I need to train inside the Nano. Uh, let's see if I see something. Yeah, this is this is a three hours video during all the process. So it's just screen capture directly from the Nano. So basically I, I was, of course, this you can automate this. I did it manually because this was for teaching purposes. But yes, you can train it on the Nano. Everything was uh, done on the Nano. You, I just target different shapes, illuminations, lights, and Finally, it worked really well. I don't know if there is an example at the end. I think this one. So this is detecting other pepperoni, right? And then I used a kind of uh, robotic arm to to place the pepperoni in the place. Right? Let's see if you can see this. So and and this has done. So all the training was done in the Jetson Nano, and also the ex the execution moving the robotic arm was done there. Oh, this is a this is a long video, but yes. So let's move to somewhere here. Yeah. Uh, these were my first test. Da, 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 da. Yeah, maybe this wasn't the, the best video ever, but yeah. But basically, well, it's like yeah. starting to look tasty. Yeah, starting to look well. It looked tast tastier when I did it, so finally it was cooked also. So <laughs> yeah, this was the the final video. So Excellent. yeah, let's see if I can switch my camera to the normal one. Yeah. Okay, now 
Fantastic. So, yes, you, you can do the training on the chip. Uh, of course, it's not very fast. Uh, usually, people use a cloud GPU to do the intensive training, and then you use this, the small device. But for small trainings like this or recognizing the small objects, a Jetson Nano is perfectly usable. Yeah. So the Jetson Nano itself, if I understood correctly, it runs uh, Linux. So I, I can sort of mm -hmm. log into it like I would do on a Linux PC, but then it's accelerated almost with with this with uh, this machine learning capability. Is that right? Ah, uh, exactly. Yeah, it, that is right. It's like a Raspberry Pi with a GPU, a kind of Raspberry Pi with a GPU. So Raspberry Pi is perfectly also valid for some tasks, but when you need some extra performance or an OpenCV or an AI-intensive application, of course, Raspberry Pi is not prepared for that, mostly because of the CUDA compatibility, and then you can move directly to, to Jetson. Mm -hmm. So what is CUDA, this C-U-D-A? CUDA. So yeah, CUDA finally is an SDK that has a, a lot of functionalities to, to talk with the GPU. Uh, so when we do an update on CUDA for, uh, G, for normal GPUs, that update mm -hmm. works also on the Jetson. So it's good because all the engineering efforts we are using for uh, GPUs are also valid for these HAI devices. OK, so, so then the CUDA is almost like a, a software API or a software layer um, yeah, yeah to, speak, to speak directly to, to the GPU. And uh, it's it, of course, it's focused on parallelization. So uh, yeah. we have this CUDA course that uh, runs very well, this kind of neural networks, which needs a lot of cores, more than, G, more than CPUs. Yeah. So when I want to develop um, some software uh, to do some uh, machine learning type application, where do I start? I, I've, I've got my sort of Linux. Is it Ubuntu? I think based mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 operating system. Uh, what do I? Where do I start? What programming interface do I have? What programming languages do I have yeah. available? So I'm gonna so quickly. Uh, this uh, this is a five minute. I don't know how. I think we have time for five minutes video, right? It's if I, I can speak over this video, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so this is the from it's a zero to hero introduction uh, I have okay. recorded. So basically, this is a this is how you plug directly the SD card into the Nano, and then you start doing the, this installation. So basically, you start yeah, with that normal. Ubuntu installation, uh, you need to click next, next, next. It's going to create a small swap partition because the Jetson Nano, yeah, much better now. The Jetson Nano has a two gigabytes memory, but also you may need a bit more memory for uh, some tasks because probably you want the, the fast memory for the GPU and not for the, maybe for having Telegram there. So yeah, you create the swap partition and after a few minutes, you, you will have everything ready to run. Um, if you want to start from scratch, there is a repository, uh, Dustin, uh, a colleague, uh, a teammate has, has made. So basically, well, I'm running just a quick command here that summarizes 10 commands that you will see. No, I think in the, the, the execution permission. And basically, this is going to execute a uh, script running these 10 commands. Basically, it's cloning the repository and building it, right? Mm -hmm. OK. So this. If you do this from scratch, it will take 40 minutes, maybe. Uh, and in 40 minutes, you could be doing uh, some object inference because we inc are including also some example videos. During the installation, you have also a menu to download uh, some of the models. Uh, you can download all of them or only the ones you want to use. And basically, it's, it's really easy to to run. You, you will see now. So it will take some time downloading, of course, because some of these models are really big. Could, so, could you so. just explain what those those models are? What sort of choices do yeah. you have there? What do they contain? Yeah, so some of them are let's see, some of them are for detecting objects. So yeah, Google Net, ResNet, all, almost all of them are, are for uh, object detection. Some of them are for let's see if I see something specific like PathNet. So for example, PathNet is for pedestrians detection. MultiPath also multi pedestrian. So FaceNet for faces, of course. So if you want to do something, I don't know, you want to put a camera in your balcony to detect how many people are crossing the street, it's really easy to have a camera and just with a line in your command uh, in, the, in, the, in the terminal, you can detect and start counting people. So by default, it's going to put some kind of a squares over the people, but with probably 10 lines of Python, you can make a counter of people. So that's yeah. it's really easy even for beginners. So I'm going to go forward yeah. a bit. 
During the installation, you will have the option, the option to install PyTorch. And this is only if you want to train directly in the in the Nano. So in this case, uh, for this reason, I didn't click it. it. It will take more time because the compilation of PyTorch takes uh, maybe almost an hour, maybe sometimes, because this is a very okay. small device. And yes, what I'm going to do here is just opening, uh, there is a folder which contains some example videos. So I'm going to open the, yeah, the pedestrians ones. And you will see. So this is a random, uh, yeah, random park with random people walking. And here with a line. So this is a line. I think you almost can read it. So I'm launching just the detectnet.py, which is a script that directly analyzes the yeah. the video. Okay. And it's going to do it's going to do it right, not perfect. So if you want to do it much better, there are some people, sometimes you are missing people. If you want to do it perfect, you probably need a specific model like PetNet. Yeah. So basically, let's see. I, I'm gonna go. So I'm gonna select PetNet. I'm gonna pause it here. Yeah. So basically, it's the thing. What I'm doing here is uh, running the TechNet, but I'm saying, OK, I'm going to say network equals PetNet. And just with this, you are choosing which model you want to run. I select the video. And then you will see that the result is much better. Um, we are not detecting all the objects, just uh, pedestrians now. But it's missing less frames. So takes like 30 seconds to start or something the first time. This is speed up a bit, because if not. So yeah, it works better. Of course, uh, dogs are not detected. Plants are not detected like before. But uh, it's optimized for pedestrians. And of course, yeah. you can you can select your own models. You can create your own models, and you can put it there. So yeah. this is for object detection. And another quick example is for segmentation. So this is another video. And, and in this one, we are going to use uh, a model call, called Cityscapes. And it's going to, well, I'm using the segnet uh, script because this is for segmentation. And this is going to yeah, segment it. Like when you are running, you are driving a Tesla and you are detecting yeah, the street, buildings. So this is going to do the same. And if anyone wants to create a self driving car, with this, you can create a very simple uh, self, -drive, self driving car because probably you can be detecting road. And if you have road, you go forward. If you have something that is not road, you stop. And this is a very silly uh, self driving car, but it could work for an example. And probably this is enough for a lot of uh, university projects and it's really easy to, to use. Exactly. Yeah. So that's interesting. So the I think that's one of the, the biggest challenge about any sort of machine learning or AI application is actually collecting enough data so that you can then analyze it to find out which, yeah, so how can I recognize what I'm looking for in this mass of data that I have? And those models then are sort of pre-prepared. Um, so where do those models come from? Are they, are they um, uh, public models or are they uh, in, developed by universities? How do they actually come into yeah. existence? So, mainly are developed by universities, public, even Google that has the Google Net and and in the repository we have in the dusting one you can download. It's if you want to to try to find it, it's called uh, Hello AI. It's on Hello AI on GitHub, and with that we have included all these models. Of course, you can create your own one. Sometimes you need to transform the model to be written to be read by the Jetson, but yeah, mainly we are using public models. Okay, and uh, last question for for you on on this topic is: uh, What's your advice for someone getting started? What's the best way? So the best way is, of course, if if they can uh, buy in a Jetson Nano. It it is not because I work at Nvidia and say, hey, please buy. It is because it's a really good investment. And even if finally you I don't know get bored, which is strange, you can use it for a lot of stuff because it's really powerful. When I was uh, developing in the Nano. Uh, I usually um, I can have YouTube videos there. I can be uh, sending files through Telegram using uh, uh, Visual Studio, the open source version, at the same time. Which is so it's not as support, as powerful as a laptop, but mm -hmm. almost, and it could be useful for a lot of stuff. So for that price, I think it's a very cheap uh, computer that you can use for multiple purposes. Yeah. And also, it's an amazing platform to start with AI that also can be put in an industrial environment. Super. So the, the Jetson Nano development kit is also available on the Elector store. So if you're interested, we can, we'll can we provide some links uh, for everybody at the end of the show to uh, to go and find that. Um, 
And uh, yeah, maybe that's going to be their their first entry point into the world of exciting world of machine learning. Yes, yes, Super. yes. One thing uh, before uh, we switch to we move to Derek. So we are really interested on in universities who want to do things with, with Jetson. So if mm -hmm. any of the assistants mm -hmm. uh, or viewers uh, are related with the university, please uh, send me an email, and we yeah. can do something even with a lector. So also you can write to a lector directly, and you can send me the contact, Stuart. But we are really interested yeah. on having contact with universities because we think this is a uh, this is the right platform to to start teaching AI. Absolutely. I was actually just talking to somebody else this afternoon about uh, an AI-based uh, or machine learning project in the in the industrial sector. So mm -hmm. um, there's lots of EU-funded projects going on in that uh, space over here as well. Super. Well, thanks ever so much for that, Azia, that great introduction. Um, what I'd like to do now is move uh, back to uh, to Derek. And um, from SparkFun, there's the, the SparkFun JetBot. Now, this is uh, another AI kit, and it uses the Jetson Nano and puts it on top of a, a robot um, capability. But there's also a, a bit more attached to that because obviously the, the Jetson Nano itself doesn't have motor drivers, it doesn't have sensor inputs and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, Spark Kits put together a whole package of, of boards and, uh, and, and mechanical hardware in order to make that happen. So Derek, thanks for joining us to share us more about this. Um, just to give us a, a brief overview of, of the, the Spark Fun Jetbot. <clears throat> yeah, um, first of all, we can't take 100% credit for the Jetbot. The Jetbot, um, when the Jetson Nano was first released a couple years ago, um, it was actually a public and open source project by a, a group of NVIDIA engineers. Um, okay. They had, they had, a, they had a, basically a robot that was it, it relied a lot on 3D printed um, parts, so you could actually download um, the the files, 3D print the parts, uh, and then they gave you a bomb of materials to go find um, um, in other places. And part of our partnership with NVIDIA was how do we how do we take this project, which is a really amazing learning platform, and make it accessible for those people that don't have a 3D printer or just want to have an out-of-the-box experience for the most part. Um, and so this is actually a, a back and forth collaboration of sorts around how do we take that experience that you had with the original JetBot, um, their 3D printed version, and and make an out of the box version. And so working with them and, and making sure that everything worked in terms of the models and camera angles and things like that, you see the JetBot that we have today. It looks something like this. Okay. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, yes, it's good, good to see it all in, in uh, constructed there in one piece together. Yeah, and so this is actually so this is the the one that I built up for the the article lector article. So it looks a little different than the one that would come out of the box that you have a, a photo of in the slides. Um, but it, it essentially consists of a nano uh, and then a, some SparkFun hardware in terms of uh, a motor driver um, and a small OLED display. So when you actually burn, the, it comes with a specific. Um, Linux image, you burn to an SD card, you plug that SD card in, um, and then when you turn it on, on the, the image, it gives you actually um, your address that you type in, you know, IP address, so you yeah. actually log in um, through your browser. Um, so instead of command line based stuff, um, similar to what Azia was doing, it's all through Jupyter Labs and Jupyter Notebooks, so it's highly accessible um, and approachable for those of us that it, that seemed a little scary. Um, okay. And I'll be honest, this was my first foray into not only machine learning, but it was also my first foray into, I would say professional level Python as well. So I was learning Python and my first experience with machine learning at the same time around the JetBot, as well as an, another kit, uh, the DLI course kit. So like, this is my the platform that I've learned machine learning on and AI on, and it's been a really interesting journey um, to be doing that with a piece of partner hardware because it's 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 really highlighted some of the pitfalls that we need to as SparkFun then help teach to um, and, and with tutorials and things like that around it with the kit. Yeah. Um, so that's really yeah. important, isn't it? It's to, to develop that experience yourself in order that you can see what the pitfalls are and, and have those prepared answers for the adults in the room that are going to answer the hard questions. 
Yeah, yeah, and it's just, it's just about demystifying hardware uh, and and getting it working um, at an approachable level. Um, you know, I was like, I was like taking notes. I have a whole page of notes um, from just your slides at the beginning because I'm also learning at the same time that I'm digesting that and and helping others learn how to incorporate AI and machine learning into their projects. Um, Super. Yeah. That's good to hear. So, um, yeah, so we, we're just saying about how we, we program the Jetbot. So Python seems to be the, 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 the go-to language for doing this. And I think a lot of our uh, participants will, will already have had some experience with Python. But then you, you mentioned JupyterLab. So what's JupyterLab? So Jupyter Labs and Jupyter Notebooks is, is basically a, a programming environment for Python. And it's, it's one of the ways where you can, especially if you're working on remote machines, um, be able to, it's essentially an easy way to SSH into or a, a, a remote computer. And then be able to write um, notebooks, collect data in it, work through mm -hmm. data. Um, it's it's a platform that's really useful for those of us doing a lot of data science um, yeah. because you can run an experiment and have it crunch through numbers and spit out graphs and, and visuals and things like that. Um, so that's what it's designed for. But um, using the JetBot and NVIDIA, a lot of their content is rounded as a, using it almost as a step debugger or being able to run code step by step with mm -hmm. explanations in between. So when I, I came across one of these notebooks the other day as I was uh, writing an article, and it seems to be that it's it's not just about the code. It also allows you to sort of document um, your experiences and, and make notes to share with other people. Is, is that Would that be a good description? Yeah. Yeah. So instead of having to have lines and lines of comments and code and it makes everything really muddy, you can just have code blocks and then text blocks, um, which if... If you've ever run through um, heavier duty example code, sometimes you just get lost in, in um, comments. And so it helps to remove that and make it a little clearer. Exactly. So obviously the the, the Jetbot, na um, uh, uh, the Jetson Nano is almost like a, like a PC um, in its you have functionality. So how do we get access to the IOs? Um, what sort of SparkFun modules do you recommend? And what interfaces? SPI, I squared C, Jet GPIOs? What's the best uh, the best interfacing? Yeah, so um, NVIDIA, NVIDIA released the Python library for the GPIO pins themselves. So if you're used to using the, the Raspberry Pi IO library, it's very similar to that for Python. Okay. Um, the SparkFun hardware that works with it um, the best out of the box is our, um, a lot of our quick boards that are supported by Python. And there's about 30 different boards out there. Um, and we're adding to it as we go that are supported in Python. They're all I squared C and they right. use a boots. So I can actually on here, you can see. So here's the OLED display and I have a quick cable. I just unplugged it. Uh, that's four wires, power ground, um, SDA, SCL, and we can daisy chain those together on the robot. Um, so it's just one bus, and if I wanted to add, for example, a distance sensor to this, I can take my distance sensor, and I can very quickly add it to the bus, and then I can mount it, and now I have a distance sensor right next to the camera in Super. a matter of seconds, right? And now yeah. it's about more about programming it and using that distance sensor rather than wiring it, making sure, how do I do this? How do I solder? What do I, it's just plug and play and we're off and running. So the the kit's been on the, on the market for a while now. What sort of uh, like applications and projects have you seen um, coming out of SparkFun and also the, the community uh, around SparkFun? Uh, a lot of, uh, universities are using this as a, a platform for introduction to, to AI and when it comes to robotics. Um, mm -hmm. So that's probably the biggest one out there that I've seen. A couple of projects that I've built have been really focused around taking parts of the JetBot that are JetBot specific and then putting them on different robot chassis and then figuring out different applications for that. So. One of them that I first, I saw the robot and I immediately wanted to get add to it was, so this is a, a Sphero Rover, which is an educational robotics company. Um, you might've seen them in ball robots. 
Yeah, um, yeah. But I took Jetson Nano, the camera, and some other other components, and I added it to this. So this is a JetBot, but using the rover as my platform rather than uh, the other chassis, which it communicates with the Nano via UART. And so I can get all of the sensor data from the rover that's, oh. there's color sensors, com uh, compass, all this stuff, I can get it back into the rover or into the Nano um, at some, just with some basic API calls and be able to use those to make decisions. Um, with this being a track robot, I don't know if you can tell, but it's, they're pretty dirty. I was tr I've been working on building and doing a, a training a model to find um, weeds in my lawn and so that I can send this out into my yard and as it drives around in the grass, it finds it and then GPS, it tags it with a GPS tag right. and then be able to download that file and be able to open it up on Google Earth and know exactly where all the weeds are in my lawn. <laughs> um, and that's been this a really interesting, interesting model to train. Um, because it, you know weeds are the same color as your lawn and there's a whole bunch of different ones. And so collecting that data and training that data has been some arduous task. So, that, so in that particular case, then what you've done, you've, you've started off uh, collecting your own data set, I guess, then to, to train the mo model. Um, how, how much data do you need to collect in order to get a model to a stage where it really starts to function as you want it to? Yeah, and that's, and that's where, um, so both the DLI course kit um, or DLI course that's free with the Nano um, and the JetBot, the Jupyter Notebooks go, have you go through that data collection process. Um, and usually if you get a good, I would say between 30 and 100 images, if you're doing just some basic recognition of, you know, the DLI course makes you go through like a thumbs up, thumbs down and recognize photos there or images there. Um, it just depends on how, you know, my, my first problem with learning machine learning was that I assumed that it always wanted a really good photo and not when this is really close, when this is back and dividing, you, you needed to train it against a whole bunch of, you needed variants or variable mm -hmm. rather than quality of the same thing. And so that was the what huge learning point for me was like oh i need to change the lighting condition of all these images i need to change which way my, my thumb is this way versus this left and right hand all that stuff um so yeah yeah that, that's a really interesting point the 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 you need a huge variety of, of data and, and um actually in, in the article i was writing as i was researching it i found lots of papers um on on that exactly that topic and there's one example where they fed photographs of horses into an AI to recognize horses. And when they actually analyzed to look at how it had learned what a horse was, it turned out that many of these pictures had watermarks from the people who created the photos. And all it was doing was recognizing watermarks. If there was a photo with a watermark, there was a high chance it was a horse. So it can be very, very cheeky. Um, there was another one where they looked at... Um, how it was analyzing pictures of ships and all it was doing was saying oh there's water in the picture must be a ship so um you have to be very careful in understanding how your machine learning is working and, and what what sort of features it's picking up on in order to make those decisions you may get the right answers uh, every time but that doesn't necessarily mean the right answers are based upon the thing you think it's making the decision on. yeah and i was so i was one of the projects i was building was a um I started building a door lock system so that the camera would only detect me. Um, and so I, I had it trained against a number of other people, my kids, my cat, all this stuff, and then nobody there. But then I shaved my beard. Oh dear. <laughs> I didn't have any photos. I didn't have any photo. I didn't have any images of me without a beard in the, in, so it, it didn't detect me. And so it was one of those things where it was like, Oh, like this is why when you look at um, when models are deployed for like real life use, there's thousands of images, right? Because those small minute differences make a difference when you when I have my beard. My beard is a, a three week beard versus a one week beard. Like there's there's differences there, and you 
sometimes want to be able to detect the difference between those, sometimes not. Um, just depends. Exactly. That's the one of the interesting things I think about the whole machine learning and model training process is it's, it's also a, a question of pro providing data to the, the model sometimes and saying, this is what we're not looking for. It looks similar. For example, if I'm training it to teach, uh, to, to recognize zebras, uh, I might also provide it with pictures of Dalmatians and um, and pandas, other black and white animals, and say, look, these are black and white as well, but don't mistake them for a zebra. These, these are different. And I think one of, one of the things uh, you might want to try in your particular situation is, is maybe you just want to focus on the eyes and the nose, and then you can completely scrub out the hairy parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have to be creative sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Smashing! Thank, thanks ever so much, Derek. It's been um, it's been a great overview of, of your experiences, and I uh, I've definitely learned a lot as well from, from you. And uh, it, it sounds really exciting and, and builds upon the, the stuff that I've done as well. So I, I think it'd be really interesting to see uh, uh, experience it for myself at some point. So maybe when I send the the PCB printer back, I'll, I'll get a, a, a robot here instead. <laughs> So if you'd like to find out a little bit more about the Jetson Nano and the JetBot together, uh, my colleague uh, Matthias Clausen has actually written an article. This was put up on the website this week. Um, sorry, I just got a message there. It's popped up. And um, this is, yeah, this is, uh, this is the article. Um, we've got a, a link to it later uh, in the show. And on the right-hand side, you see all the hardware parts all laid out as well to give you an idea of, of um, all the hardware that goes around the, the, the board in order to make up the entire robot. Um, it, in, in the actual article, this is the first of, of several articles on this topic in, the, in a series. So it reviews the hardware and the software. Um, it also hi highlights the, the browser-based uh, development environment of Jupyter Lab, as, as Derek was telling us, and um, explains also how the mechanical assembly of the robot. Uh, so that's all covered in there. So there we go. Great. OK, so with that wrapped up, now it's time to keep you guys busy with some questions. Um, so we've got our Q&A session. And after the Q&A session, we've also got our giveaway. Uh, where you'll be able to win one of these kits as well. So I'm just going to take us over to the Q&A section and uh, find out what everyone has been asking. So um, there's a couple of questions related to... Um, I just need to press on the right button. So one person asked uh, from my little pre-show intro is uh, which PCB machine is that? This is uh, one of two PCB printers that Elector currently has in our store. The, the one I have here and showed you earlier was the Volterra V1. Um, that prints double-sided PCBs onto FR4 material. It's also capable of, of printing onto other, other materials as well, uh, such as um, Kapton tape and, and things like that. Uh, there's another, it's also, it does double-sided. You can do through-hole components as well. There's a drill attachment. The other um, uh, PCB printer we have is um, manufactured by a, a bot factory. And that is a very interesting product. It's very much more like a traditional inkjet printer in the way it creates the, the boards. It can create up to four layer PCBs. And it does it by using conductive inks from a like an inkjet type uh, print head. Um, it prints those layers and prints insulation layers. And by leaving holes in the insulation layers, it actually creates vias between all the different layers. So um, they're actually very, uh, very clever um, rapid prototyping um, machines. Uh, they're very capable. You can, we've had uh, some examples where people have developed circuits for power supplies and they've had 50 amps of current passing through some of the tracks. We've also had um, people doing um, RF applications of up to two and a half gigahertz and more. Uh, so that answers that as well. Um, really, is it only for prototyping is another question. I, I think it's probably mostly for, for prototyping, although some people have actually made USB sticks and uh, that actually slot into a, P, uh, into a computer. And the, the tracks themselves are exceptionally hard wearing. They've actually managed several thousand cycles um, with, uh, with some wear on the, on the tracks, but uh, it was still functional. So that's really cool. 
Uh, we have a question um, here on the Spark Fun uh, kit, and obviously yeah, from the N NVIDIA side as well. So, are you guys using uh, you using Ubuntu version eighteen point oh four? Is the question. Uh, what what uh, what are you using? How is it uh, regularly updated, and, and what do you recommend? Uh, maybe as he is. We are using a modified version. I think the base now is 19, but I need to check. Um, I don't know if you know from Sparfan. I think um, I think our base image, so again, uh, we're actually going through a transition to follow what NVIDIA has been doing. So before, um, with the 4 gig, when it came out, the original JetBot came out, you burned an, uh, an image, a specific image for the JetBot to an SD card. OK. Um, yeah, and then, yeah. yeah, the base is 18. The base is 18.04, yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're looking at moving towards and, and working with NVIDIA towards a containerized or a Docker image version for JetBot stuff as well. Um, so that's that's one of the things we're working on, because that's that's where everything has gone in terms of content and content specific image installs. Super. Well, thanks very much to Matthias for that question. I've got another one here from Raymond Smith. Uh, he asked, what power do you need for the Nano and can it upload data remotely? And that was actually something that occurred to me as we were talking, Derek. Uh, you, 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 you made this ro robot. Uh, I mean, how long does it run on a battery or, or do you have to have a, a cable running to it? Yeah, it's so it's. Um, Runs off five volts at I think three or four amps, okay. and so it's and that's and that's in um, its standard setting. You could, there's a there's a lower power setting as well that if you were let's say running a model to you could use, but if you were training, I would recommend um, the higher power and then have it just plugged into the wall mm -hmm. um, while you're doing that because you would, probably wouldn't want to be training training it on a battery. Um, yeah. But for example, the the rover <laughs> one, it actually plugs into the battery for the rover, and it runs. It's run for over an hour, so it it's does a pretty good job of running on batteries. So, as Azia, I I guess in the in the in the world of indus, industrial uh, applications and, and commercial applications, um, there's probably also some need to have some sort of power saving mode. Is is there something like that on the Nano to to you know quickly yes. do a recognition and then sleep again? Yes. It, well, it has uh, two two modes uh, two modes of power. Uh, with the developer kit, it was wastes more energy. If you have the board, the board alone, it wastes much less. I don't remember exactly, but I think it's like one point five or something. Really, really low power. But with the developer kit, it's it's higher. So the, the low power mode now it's uh, five watts, and you have the ten watts mode. In fact, if you okay. connect it to any USB, um, and that is not a high power USB, it's going to run in five five watts mode. Okay. That's that's good to know. And you can you can programmatically uh, switch uh, from one high power high power mode to a low power mode. Yes. Okay. So you can avoid using fans because if you are doing a really heavy training with uh, uh, ten watts, probably you need to add sometimes a small fan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we've got a question here from Jean Marie um, Gastineau. Uh, how do you store the training data on the Jetson? I, I, is it you know, just part of the filing system. Do I sort of s save all my my images that I've collected as JPEGs in in a in a folder, or how does that work? Yeah. So uh, in the example I showed, I collected the JPEGs and it creates uh, directly a file with the training data. I refer to to Jan Marie to a video that Dustin published where there is a quick uh, yeah quick uh, introduction to to the training and it's really it's really well documented so i will recommend to check that video because you will see how the model is stored how you convert the model to a readable model because you need to run a small script to, to yeah. switch from one model type to another and uh, and that's it yes okay oh we've got another question here from john marie as well um how long does it take to train resnet on the jetson sort of uh, approximately hmm. what what would you Deep comparing with a GPU, or <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but, um, is 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 there a way to sort of gauge it, how long these these models take to train? So it takes quite long if you are doing a big training. But for these small trainings where you are training for recognizing the small objects and 
that's almost almost instantaneously. It's, it's t- it will take a few minutes maybe, but um, I cannot give an answer of on the orders of magnitude. But it's I will recommend using always a GPU if you want to do a big training with a data ho- augmentation and this stuff uh, and the Jetson for kind of manual training or for small applications. Super. Then we've got another question here from, um, I'm not sure if it's Al Esplana or AI Esplana, which would be more, <laughs> more fitting to the mm. show today. It says, uh, how do you increase the number of data sets for your model if you have limited time to get to them? Um, one, of the, one of the things I found when I was, um, when I was doing my article, I, I made a very simple single neuron, neural network uh, in order to recognize colors. And, and in order to sort of expand the data set, I, um, I was recognizing RGB colors, so the red, the green, and the blue values. Uh, I just added some a little bit of randomization just to almost account for, for what Derek was talking about earlier, uh, um, account for lighting variation and tone variation. Um, is, is that something you can do on, on these big models, or do you really have to go out there and collect a lot more data if you're a bit short? Yeah, you can try always um, using this kind of uh, data augmentation. I, I will do that more in a GPU than a, than a Jetson. But uh, yeah, so what I did for increasing the number of data sets was taking more samples when, when we are doing images. And I haven't tried this uh, with uh, voice, for example. I have tried with GPT-2, for example. So I tried GPT-2, uh, that's probably you know, uh, this. Uh, this big transformers model on a Jetson NX, not, in, not on the Nano, and it works really well. Uh, so GPT-2, I can configure it runs on a Jetson NX. Uh, it's the small, the small of the, the smaller of the models. So yeah, if you want to increase uh, the number of data sets, I will go to a GPU for a GPU and doing the, the data augmentation, augmentation there. Super. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for our Q&A. Um, I have to say, I, I don't do this alone. I'm sitting alone in my office, but there's a, a whole team of people in the background that make sure these webinars actually happen and support us and, and, and keep everything running. So uh, quick thank you to all the team that's behind me helping out. And one of the things they do is they find out who's going to be um, winning the prizes today. And I'm very happy to share that we have three winners. Uh, the first I have is Aphrodite Pidis, then I also have Morten Gertner and Timothy Porta. So those are the three winners today. Uh, the team will be in touch with you after the show and will be finding out your details in order that they can get your prizes to you. So congratulations, good luck with that. And if you manage to uh, do something really interesting with that, or even, even if you just learn something new that you'd like to share with us, get in touch. Maybe we'll be able to add it to an article or we can work on an article together with you and share that with the whole community. Now, of course, webinars continue. We've got lots more exciting webinars planned for the rest of the year. And the next one, if you're interested in Bluetooth and wireless technology, it's for you because we're going to be talking about rapid prototyping Bluetooth low energy using Android apps and the MIT App Inventor. And to make it easier for you to register, I've created a little bit.ly link here. So all you need to write down is 3TZDJEP. And with that, you should be able to go and find that next webinar. Or if you type in rapid prototype in Bluetooth Elector webinar into your favorite search engine, uh, you should be able to find it soon enough. Or just wait for the next newsletter because we'll be um, promoting it on that as well. So thanks ever so much for watching today's webinar. Firstly, if you want to find out more about those, um, here we go. If you want to find out more about those AI-based articles we were talking about, the, the article I wrote on neural networks or the one from Matthias Clausen on the on the robot, uh, there's a little link there that should appear on your screen now. So if you click on that, you actually go to a page where all our AI-tagged articles are found. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank everyone for participating today. I feel like I've learned a hell of a lot and I'm really excited to see this technology. AI, machine learning, and especially AI at the edge is, is a fascinating uh, technology and, and uh, space of, of research and development at the minute. It's definitely going places. There's a lot to do, lots of new things uh, being applied. I think we get the impression from the press that it's all about um, cameras and recognizing faces 
and, um, and, and auto autonomous driving cars and things like that. But there's so many applications. It's being used in agriculture around the world to help uh, farmers in India better um, improve their, their crops. Uh, it's, it's helping uh, companies improve their manufacturing processes in, in, uh, in, in, in industrial factories who are manufacturing metal parts, for example. Uh, it's also helping to save water, make better weather predictions, all sorts of uh, applications. And uh, it'd be great to participate in that, I think, for the future. It's definitely something I think people uh, who are looking for a career in electronics and uh, engineering are going to get involved in more and more. I'd like to say also thanks very much to Azia from NVIDIA and Derek from Spark Farm for participating. Don't forget, if you have your Electro magazines to hand, there's uh, Derek's article in there on the, uh, on the robot itself as well. So that's a, a great starting point for those people who won the kits today because they'll be able to get going with that. Um, this video is going to be available on YouTube on our Elector TV channel. And um, we'd like to uh, say thank you ever so much for joining us today and join us next time for exciting insights into the world of electronics and engineering. Thanks, guys. Thank Great you so much, Stuart. Thank you, Eric. Bye. Bye-bye.